Despite being only 1.65 meters tall and weighing just 135 pounds, Nicky Scarfo's size did not prevent him from rising to the top of the Philadelphia Mafia. He was probably the most violent American Mafia boss in the last 50 years. There was no room for negotiation with him. Scarfo even killed his friends. During that bloody era of the Philadelphia Mafia, between 26 and 30 members were probably murdered. Raised in the harsh streets of the underworld, his political cunning and efficiency in eliminating his enemies propelled him to power. To the highest echelons of the city's most powerful organization, this is the story of the feared mafia boss who many believe should never have held that position. Nicodemo Domenico Scarfo was born in Brooklyn, New York, on March 8, 1929. His parents had emigrated from Italy in search of a better life, but encountered hard times in America. In October of that year, the stock market crashed, leaving families penniless and desperate. Eventually, Scafo's parents realized it was time to leave the city. They hoped to survive the Great Depression by moving in with their relatives in Philadelphia. From a young age, Nick Scarfo was surrounded by the world of organized crime and gangsters who were idolized crime and gangsters who were idolized. This culture enveloped him from an early age, and he grew up flourishing in it and loving it. The Philadelphia crime family, a branch of the New York Mafia, ran operations in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Scarfo's uncles, the Piccolo brothers, were heavily involved and were treated like celebrities, the movie stars of the streets. In 1947, Scarfo graduated from Benjamin Franklin High School and was voted the most talkative by his classmates. He then tried his luck in amateur boxing, but taller boxers had a significant advantage over his height of 1.65 meters. In the 1960s, Scarfo hung up his gloves, knowing he could make more money as a gangster. In 1959, the newly ascended boss in Philadelphia wanted to eliminate one of his own men, Angelo Bruno. However, Bruno had connections in the New York Mafia, and instead of approving the hit, the Mafia removed the boss and installed Bruno in his place. It was a new era for the Philadelphia Mafia. Bruno encouraged his soldiers to avoid unnecessary violence and keep a low profile, earning him the nickname the Gentle Dawn. The precedent set by Angelo Bruno was one of negotiation, patience, and strategy. As a low-level member of Bruno's gang, Nicky Scarfo had no interest in following the rules. In 1962, Bruno's consigliere, Joe Rugnetta, took an interest in Scarfo because they were from the same part of Italy. He even tried to arrange the marriage of his daughter to the young soldier. Most members of the family would have considered it an honor, but not Scarfo. Scarfo scoffed at the prospect and told Rugnetta that he wouldn't marry his daughter because she was too ugly. This led Rugnetta to go to Bruno and ask him to order Scarfo's killing. Fortunately for Scarfo, his uncle Niccolo Piccolo was then a captain in the Mafia, so Bruno refused to authorize the hit. On May 25, 1963, Scarfo got into trouble again while dining at a restaurant in South Philadelphia. He and his companion sat at an empty table, which turned out to belong to an Irish longshoreman who had just stepped away to greet someone. An argument ensued, and Scarfo grabbed a knife and stabbed the longshoreman to death. In court, Scarfo claimed he acted in self-defense and received a lenient sentence of less than a year in prison. Scarfo got off lightly, but the Philadelphia Mafia was furious. While the gangster liked to kill people in public, Bruno disliked attracting police attention or any other kind of scrutiny. When Scarfo was released from prison in 1964, the Mafia was waiting for him. Members of Bruno's organization were basically telling Angelo, this kid is a hothead and only brings trouble. We should eliminate him to get rid of the headache he will cause. But Bruno decided that more violence wouldn't help. Instead, the boss assigned Scarfo to manage the illegal businesses in Atlantic City. It was a clear slap in the face. Philadelphia was where the action was. 
while Atlantic City was, while Atlantic City was an outdated resort town with mostly empty hotels. Scarfo may have been exiled, but he kept an eye on the Philadelphia Mafia, and when he returned, he was a force to be reckoned with. Shortly after, he met a minor criminal named Nick Caramandi. Caramandi didn't care much about Scarfo at first, but he soon realized that Scarfo, despite being just a soldier at the time, was very connected. Scarfo wasn't making big money, but Caramandi gave him the green light to rob whoever he wanted without worrying about repercussion. Nicky Scarfo was a handsome, well-dressed man who loved tailored clothing and was always meticulous about his appearance and hairstyle. Behind his confident air, Scarfo hid a range of insecurities. He had a high-pitched voice and a complex about his height, earning him the nickname Little Nicky. It became a nickname used in his early days in the Mafia, but never in his presence. That would have been an instant death sentence. On November 2, 1976, New Jersey legalized gambling in Atlantic City. After decades of decline, the city transformed overnight. The skyline turned into a casino empire, benefiting everyone, not just the big players, but also the smaller ones. However, the New Jersey governor at the time sent a clear message to the Mafia. Keep your dirty hands out of Atlantic City and stay out of our state. But that didn't deter little Nicky from profiting off the casinos. He quickly recognized that Atlantic City was located on a barrier island and that building casinos would require reinforced concrete. That same year, Scarfo and his nephew, Phil Leonetti, started a construction company called Scarf, Inc. Developers soon discovered they had no choice but to hire Scarf. Inc. or crossing Nicky, Scarfo could be deadly. For the first six casino hotels built in Atlantic City, Scarfo's company handled all the subcontracting for the concrete work. But Scarfo's business ambitions didn't end there. He partnered with his friend Frank Giras, who ran Local 54, the Bartenders and Hotel Workers Union, with over 10,000 members. This union was the most powerful in Atlantic City. With a simple phone call, Scarfo could have bartenders and waiters go on strike, shutting down bars and restaurants across the city. Frank Gerace strengthened his control over Local 54 and paid the mobster for protection, giving him between $20,000 and $30,000 a month. Other union leaders knew to stay away from Scarfo and his thugs. Those who didn't paid the price. The public execution of Judge Edwin Helfand sent a clear message to Atlantic City. No one goes against Nick Scarfo. In 1979, it was expected that developers would spend over a billion dollars in the next decade on construction. Of casinos on the boardwalk, which meant a lot of money for Nicky Scarfo's concrete business. However, a contractor named Vincent Falcone thought Scarfo did mediocre work and voiced his opinion all over the city unaware of how dangerous it was to speak out. His comments infuriated Scarfo to the point where he decided to eliminate him. On December 16, 1979, Scarfo invited Falcone to a beach house in New Jersey. Scarfo was accompanied by his nephew Phil Leonetti, his friend Larry Merlino, and a plumbing contractor named Joseph Salerno. When the group settled in the living room, Scarfo asked Falcone, to go to the kitchen to get glasses for mixing drinks. As Falcone turned around in the kitchen, Leonetti approached from behind with a gun and shot him in the back of the head. Falcone collapsed, and an excited Scarfo leaned over him and said, He's still breathing. Give him another. Leonetti shot Falcone in the chest and then covered his head. Scarfo looked directly at the corpse and said, I love this. I absolutely love this. Scarfo's men left Falcone's body in the trunk of his Mercury, where the police found it the next day. This incident captured Scarfo's absolute bloodlust and highlighted the problem with him. There was a witness. Joseph Salerno, terrified by the crime and its possible implications, called the police a week later. New Jersey police tracked down Scarfo, Larry Merlino, and Phil Leonetti, arresting all three men. 
Scarfo was released on bail, and although his trial was scheduled for the following year, he continued his life as usual. Back on the streets, business was booming for Scarfo. His concrete company, Scarf Inc., had five new casino hotels under contract. With his absolute control of the local bartenders' union, the mobster had connections throughout the city. Scarfo had a stake in everything happening in the casinos. Violence, money, the bartenders' union, and construction. He was at the center of it all. Meanwhile, back in Philadelphia, Boss Angelo Bruno was starting to have problems with his own family. His new consigliere, Tony Bananas, Capo Negro, wanted to strip him of power in a complex plot that eventually led to one of the most notorious murders within the Philadelphia Mafia. On March 21, 1980, after dinner, Angelo Bruno was driven home by an associate of the Mafia. They stopped in front of Bruno's house, and as they were talking, Bruno lit a cigarette. The Mafia associate then remotely lowered the automatic windows. From the shadows emerged a man who put a double-barreled shotgun behind Bruno's right ear and fired. The gentle Don was instantly killed. The scene was gruesome, with his mouth open and the bloody remnants of a discharged double-barreled shotgun visible. The New York Mafia was furious. They had not authorized Bruno's murder, and Capo Negro would pay the ultimate price for disobeying one of the Mafia's cardinal rules. It marked a horrific death. He was beaten with hammers, axes, pipes, and then shot 13 times. The message was clear. This man had become too greedy, and that's why he was dead. After Bruno's murder, his underboss, Philip Testa, was named Boss. Testa saw himself as Scarfo's mentor, from soldier to consigliere, a dramatic leap for a man from humble origins. Scarfo had shown he wasn't afraid of violence, using it whenever he deemed necessary. Sixteen years after being exiled to Atlantic City, 51-year-old Nicky Scarfo secured the role of consigliere in the powerful Philadelphia Mafia. He was known as a successful moneymaker, a cold-blooded killer, and a man beyond the reach of the law. Scarfo earned over $300,000 from Local 54, the union he controlled. Another union leader wanted in on the action aiming to split Local 54 into two unions and control one of them. Scarfo, however, wasn't willing to share with anyone. When he complained about the other leader's efforts, he was told that the man would receive orders to stop. However, the man never stopped. So, on December 16, 1980, he was eliminated with six bullets to the head and neck. It wasn't just Scarfo's doing. Philip Testa, the boss of the Mafia, was also involved. Unlike the previous boss, Angelo Bruno, who opposed violence, less than a year into his reign, this policy would change against the advice of some close associates. Testa had chosen an old-school member of the Philadelphia Mafia as his underboss, Peter Casella. According to Mafia rules, Casella would be next in line if something happened to Testa. So, Casella decided to make something happen. On March 14, 1981, Casella ordered the planting of a nail bomb with 21 sticks of dynamite under Testa's front porch. Philip Testa arrived home in the early hours of the next day. Someone from Casella's team across the street watched his every move. The person who built the bomb sat in a van on the opposite side of the street with a remote-controlled detonator. Testa ascended the steps, and just as he was about to enter the door, the person pressed the button and the bomb exploded, hurling Testa through his front door. Many in the Philadelphia Mafia suspected that Peter Casella had ordered the assassination without sanction from the New York Mafia. However, Casella received a pass due to his seniority. He was essentially put in the shadows and instructed to leave for Florida, never to return. With Casella out of the way, the New York Mafia appointed Nicky Scarfo as the boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. Unlike his predecessors who lived in Philadelphia, 
Scarfa remained in Atlantic City and ran the Mafia from afar. Regardless of what lower-ranking members said, people in Philadelphia resented and viewed Scarfo as an outsider imported from Atlantic City. Despite his knowledge, Scarfo lacked the skills and capability to effectively lead this organization. Over the years, he surrounded himself with trusted men, appointing lifelong friend Chucky Merlino as underboss and his nephew Phil Leonetti as captain. Mafia associate Nick Caramandu, assigned to one of Scarfo's extortion teams, began imposing taxes that Angelo Bruno had never imposed before. They levied a tax on all city bookmakers, and anyone involved in drugs or other illegal activities had to pay. Those who refused were assaulted or killed, creating a level of violence that rivaled anything the country had seen in terms of murder and bloodshed on the streets. For Philadelphia Mafia associate and prolific money, maker Frankie Flowers, D'Alfonso, Scarfo's demands were too much. He resisted paying the tax which Scarfo viewed as disrespectful. On October 29, 1981, Scarfo sent two of his men to beat D'Alfonso right outside the Italian market in Philadelphia. The attackers struck D'Alfonso's legs, torso, and head with a steel shaft and a baseball bat. This public beating starkly contrasted with the days of the gentle dawn. It was meant to assert their presence, power, and the consequences for anyone who spoke to authorities. When questioned by the police, D'Alfonso claimed he had been hit by a truck. However, Scarfo and his thugs were already on the radar of law enforcement in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. His frequent travels between Atlantic City and Philadelphia made it easy for authorities to track his movements. Nicky Scarfo loved being in the spotlight, showcasing the luxuries that a life of crime afforded him. He frequented trendy local spots and was recognized as a celebrity, much like many of his subordinates. Scarfo would often take the whole gang out to dinner, securing the best table and often leaving without paying the bill, simply getting up and walking out. At 53 years old, Nicky Scarfo was the kingpin of the underworld in Philadelphia. The Mafia boss had infiltrated the mayor's office in Atlantic City, and he controlled Local 54, the city's most powerful union, reaping thousands and living a luxurious lifestyle. But this man, known for his violence and power, was about to lose control. In July 1982, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit upheld a federal weapons charge against Nicky Scarfo, a charge he had been fighting for over a year. Police had confiscated weapons from his apartment, leading to his imprisonment. A month later, the Philadelphia Mafia boss was transferred to a federal prison in Texas to begin serving a two-year sentence. Despite being behind bars, Scarfo continued to oversee daily Mafia operations, with five of his most trusted men handling street affairs. This group included Captain Salvatore Tessa, who was highly regarded by all. 28-year-old was the son of former Mafia boss Philip Testa and a ruthless killer. Salvatore Testa, Salvatore Testa stood out in Philadelphia's organized crime family due to his skill and experience. He proved highly efficient in carrying out killings on behalf of Nicky Scarfo, showing unwavering loyalty to him. In 1982, a faction within the Philadelphia Mafia known as the Riccobean Brothers topped Scarfo's list of enemies. During Angelo Bruno's leadership, the Riccobinese could conduct independent business without sharing their profits with the Mafia. This arrangement worked under Bruno, but clashed with Scarfo's expectations. When the Riccobinese refused to share their earnings with Scarfo, he responded by sending a group of hitmen to give them an ultimatum. However, the Riccobanese proved elusive. After two failed attempts to eliminate one of the Riccobean brothers, a gangster-style war erupted on the streets of South Philadelphia. On May 13, 1982, Frank Monty, Scarfo's consigliere, became the first casualty of this war. He was shot five times in the head and back by members of the Riccobean faction. In retaliation, 
Scarfo's group killed several of their men, often in broad daylight and in public view. The conflict only ended when all members of the Rikobin faction were dead, imprisoned, or expelled from the city. Salvatore Testa emerged as the key figure leading Scarfo's efforts in the war, almost losing an arm in an ambush during the intense conflict. He played a crucial role in helping Scarfo consolidate control over the family. In January 1984, when Scarfo was released from prison in Texas, Phil Leonetti and Salvatore Testa, Salvatore Testa celebrated their boss's freedom with a cross-country trip, however. Just two months later, Scarfo faced more trouble. A federal indictment exposed ties between the Atlantic City mayor and the Philadelphia Mafia, undermining Scarfo's influence over planning and zoning in Atlantic City. Within a month, another article investigated the Philadelphia Mafia, further complicating Scarfo's position. Story focused not on Nicky Scarfo, but on his young captain, Salvatore Testa. In the article, Testa was called the fastest rising star in the Philadelphia organized crime family. The article also mentioned that Testa was on the verge of taking control of the city's mafia. Clearly, Scarfo began to be bothered by the fame of his position. At that time, Sal Testa was engaged to the daughter of Chucky Merlino, who was Scarfo's underboss. But in the spring of 1984, Testa started having second thoughts. He eventually broke off his engagement, which created a significant stir, as the wedding was already planned and all the invitations had been sent out. Chucky Merlino would not tolerate such dishonor and made sure the boss understood. It looks like this kid wants to take your position as boss. He's disrespecting you and me and my daughter, Merlino told Scarfo. It didn't take much to convince Scarfo that Salvatore Testa might try to overthrow him. Convinced of this, Scarfo assigned a team to murder the young man. On September 14, 1984, Testa agreed to meet another mafioso, a close friend at a candy store in Philadelphia's Italian market. Inside the store, a hitman took Testa by surprise and shot him twice in the head. Caramandu, one of the men assigned to clean up the mess, dumped Testa's body in a ditch in New Jersey. When gangster Nicky Scarfo assumed leadership of the Philadelphia Mafia, he faced opposition within the family and quickly eliminated his enemies. The new boss even killed his most trusted associate, a man who had never betrayed him, Salvatore Testa. No one was safe from Scarfo's wrath, a man feared by all. By 1985, Nicky Scarfo was earning substantial income from Philadelphia and Atlantic City, However, the Mafia boss was unaware that the FBI was diligently working to build a solid extortion case against him. Soon, they stumbled upon a golden opportunity as some Philadelphia officials began discussing plans for the creation of a multi-million dollar project to revitalize the city's waterfront. Before the project could move forward, the developer needed the district councilman's approval of the plan. Scarfo saw an opportunity because he had contacts in the councilman's office and could help the developer get the project approved for the right price. Scarfo's associate, Nick Caramandu, met with one of the developer's men and presented the shady proposal. If they paid Scarfo, he could guarantee the city's council approval. Caramandu didn't keep quiet and went to the authorities. From that moment on, the feds assigned an undercover agent to pose as the developer's representative. Scarfo and his men had no idea that the feds were building a case against them. While the undercover agent was on the inside, Karamandu continued to push for the requested amount. Four months later, Karamandu was arrested on extortion charges and found himself in jail, realizing his mistake. Scarfo was really upset. Karamandu had always resolved every problem. He had seen the mafia boss eliminate others for less. After three days of thinking and worrying, he finally decided he had no other option but to call the FBI and become an informant. This series of events would lead to the epic downfall of the Philadelphia Mafia under Nicky Scarfo's leadership. Scarfo's main crew members were charged with extortion, drug trafficking, money laundering, and gambling. 
Now the feds had one of Scarfo's closest associates on their side, ready to reveal everything he knew in court. A few months later, Scarfo went to trial. His longtime friend and mafia associate, Nick Karamandu, was too compelling. The 59-year-old man received a guilty verdict and was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Following year, federal authorities charged Scarfo again, accusing him of nine murders, including those of Edwin Helfand and Salvatore Testa and the attempted murder of Harry Ravini. On May 11, 1989, the jury delivered the verdict. Scarfo received an additional 55-year prison sentence on top of his existing 14-year term. Scarfo was going to disappear forever. Despite being imprisoned, Nicky Scarfo continued to lead the Philadelphia Mafia for a couple of years until the commission informed him that he was no longer the boss of Philadelphia. A new rivalry then emerged on the streets of Philadelphia. John Stanfa, sent by the commission to take over the leadership, faced off against the new blood on the streets, led by Joe Merlino. Following the conviction, six of Scarfo's men, including his own nephew, Phil Leonetti, turned into federal witnesses. Scarfo orchestrated his own downfall through his propensity for violence, which drove his subordinates to testify out of fear that he might do to them what he had done to others. Under Scarfo's leadership, the Mafia was rife with betrayal, double-crossing, triple-crossing, and paranoia. Nicky Scarfo died in prison on January 13, 2017, while serving his 55-year sentence. If the story of little Nicky Scarfo seemed otherworldly to you, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more gripping tales from history's underworld. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for watching.